Have you ever been thirsty? No, I mean really thirsty. So thirsty that you're totally consumed. How do I get my hands on water? How do I get something to slack my thirst? For years, I spent my summers working on the family farm. Family Christmas tree farm. What a lot of people don't realize about a Christmas tree farm is you see a Christmas tree on the lot at Walmart, and you go down to buy the tree, and it's a perfectly shaped cone. That doesn't come naturally. Somebody has to create that tree. And every year from the time you plant a tree till it gets about uh, mid-thigh, you're taking a knife like this one. It has an 18-inch blade. This one has a longer handle, an 18-inch handle. But typically, you'd have a 9-inch handle. Okay, and you have to go around that tree every year, and you've got to trim it. And you've got to turn it into the shape that you want it. Because every year it grows, and it grows out, and you kind of see the rough shape, but you want a very smooth look. And you can't get that with a machine. You have to take a knife. If a machine does it, it's a much rougher look. People don't like the result nearly as well. So if you take an acre of Christmas trees, you plant them on what's called five-foot centers. And so you have a tree, and five foot down the row, you have the next one, and then the next one, and they just run perfectly straight till the end of the row. Then your next row starts five feet over, then the next five feet over from that. Okay, and so hour after hour, every summer, my crew and I take our shearing knives, and we'd go every tree on the farm. Go down, and you come back. It looks really pretty when everything's smooth. It takes a long time. There are 1,450 trees to the acre, if you want to know the statistics on that. Probably didn't, too much information, but Scott Simiotti once uh, tried to figure out how many trees we had to go through in a year on the farm. And one of the things that we dreaded every year was the south field. The south field was the biggest field by far on the farm. And when you looked at that row, you knew that when you started down that row, okay, it was going to be an hour before you got to the other end. And that was one row. And you're looking at row after row. It just looks like a sea of green going out in front of you. So on hot summer days, we'd go in at night and we'd grab empty milk jugs, fill them about half full of water, freeze them. And then we'd come out in the morning and fill it the rest of the way with water. And you'd go out to the rows and you set one jug at the beginning of the row and you set the other down at the far end. So you knew when you got to the far end, at least you got some relief. You got a drink of water. Okay, cold, refreshing water. And so we'd start down the rows in the morning and I remember we'd shear for a while and I'd look back over my shoulder and I'd try to see the pickup that we had parked at that end, and I'd say, yay, we're making pretty good progress. And then I'd turn and look back this way, and I'd go, oh, no, we're not. <laughs> no. That row, is, the end is still just as far away. And pretty soon, as I'm swinging that knife, and the sweat starting to soak through my shirt, my arms getting sore and tired, and I'm looking down that row thinking, how long before I get water? How long before I can have a drink? And pretty soon, I'm consumed. I'm not worried about trees. I'm worried about water. How do I get my hands on ice cold water? How do I get a relief? And finally, at the end of the row, you'd come down and that last tree you sheared, you took your knife and you slid it in there, made sure you kept the handle out so you could find it. And then you grab that jug of water and one of the most awesome experiences you could imagine was that cold, clear water running down your throat, relieving your thirst. And today we're going to look at a Bible story that talks about thirst. But unlike the thirst I was worried about in that tree field, we're not talking about physical water, we're talking about living water. As Jesus shares about living water and the importance of that living water, if you have a bulletin, you should have a handout in there, a small handout that should have John chapter 4, 1 through 26 on it, some on the front, some on the back. If you didn't get that, um, 
there's some in the back. Yeah, we'll be referring to that uh, throughout the, uh, the message today. But as we pick up the story, Jesus and his disciples are in Judea. They're in the far south and they're headed north, to the other end of the land to Galilee. Now, they've got two routes to go, okay? The first one is the shortest, and it just runs right through the heart of Samaria. Now, there's a small problem with that if you're a Jew. The small problem is you hate the Samaritans. I mean, you hate them. But don't worry, they hate you just as much, okay? So you hate it so much that in most cases, you're willing to go east. Now, you're on foot, and you're walking, and you're going to swing all the way around Samaria, so to walk around means you're going to walk at least one or two extra days. And I'm talking hours per day. Think about the hate that that would take to add 16 hours of walking or more to your journey just to get around Samaria. Yeah, when Jesus looks at the trip to Galilee, he says, we're going straight through Samaria because I have an appointment. I have a meeting with a woman at a well. And I need to be there for her sake. So he and the disciples set out. And the story begins 6 o'clock in the evening. They're in a town called Sychar. And just outside of Sychar is a well. And Jesus takes a seat literally on the well. Now you have to realize that Jesus is fully God. So he's got the powers, okay? All-knowing all-powerful, yet on the other side, he's fully human. So he feels fatigue and thirst and hunger, and he's tired. And he sits down on the well, and he turns to his disciples and says, go ahead and go into town and get us something to eat. I'll meet you back here at the well. As they leave, unbeknownst to them, a woman is walking out to the well. Now, she's not walking out to the well at 6 o'clock at night because she wants to. No, she doesn't have a choice. She's an outcast. She would love to be there in the morning with all the other women, fellowshipping, laughing, joking, having a good time. Always, when you're working together on a tough physical task, if you have other people around you, it greatly reduces the pain, reduces the suffering. She doesn't get that option because they won't have anything to do with her. Her only choice is to come at night when nobody's around. And so here she is headed for the well that night. And at some point she has to look up and go, great, great. Things were bad enough as it was. Now some dude is sitting on the well. Now to you and I, what's the big deal? Go ahead and draw your water and be done. Go about your business. No. Because she knows full well in her culture, men and women who are strangers do not talk to each other. That is taboo, a big taboo. And then as she draws a little closer, it suddenly dawns on her, oh man, it's getting worse. The guy's a Jew. What am I supposed to do? Wait till he goes away? How long is that going to take? And as the thoughts are going through her head, all suddenly this guy says, give me a drink. What is going on with my world today? Am I in a dream? This is crazy. He shouldn't be talking to her at all. In fact, any self-respecting rabbi, not named Jesus, not only would not have talked to her, he definitely would not have asked her for a drink. And even if she had offered him water, he'd have refused it and said, not a chance. I'll go thirsty before I'll take a water from you because that would make me look really bad. And I'm above all that. But not Jesus. He turns to her and says, can I get a drink? If you look at verse 7 of chapter 4, you see her response to him. Shocked and a little bit confused. She's sitting there listening to him say, a Jewish man, I want a drink. And she responds to him, 
How is that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? She knows full well that the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And yet, Jesus doesn't turn away. He's not harsh. He's not demanding. He simply makes another statement that probably throws her a little bit more for a loop, but also grabs her curiosity. As he says to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What? Wait a minute. Who are you? Number one, why are you talking to me? But on top of that, suddenly you've got my curiosity a little bit. A gift of God? What does that mean? And living water? Do you know something that I don't know? Because I'm really confused. I'm looking at you. You have no way to draw water. And by the way, sir, just in case you don't know, it's 100 feet down to the water. How do you plan to get that? And by the way, if you happen to get it, what are you going to put it in? A second ago, you asked me for a drink. Now you're telling me you're going to give me water. You're going to give me a drink. How in the world are you going to do that? She's beginning to wonder who this man is. How he can deliver on his promise. But Jesus is unfazed. Because he simply is thinking about living water, not the physical water that she's thinking of. So as you look forward in the passage, he responds to her again. He carries on this conversation with her. And after telling her about the living water, he then says to her in verse 13, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Okay, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 what did you just say, sir? For the first time, there might be a little hope today. This would be awesome. You have water, this living water. I don't have to come back. I'm all in. Where do I get it? And she says to him, Verse 15, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Yes! I can tell all these people that rejected me, suckers, I'm out of here. I'm never coming back. You come, have a good time, grab your water, enjoy yourselves. I'm done. I've got one drink. I'm satisfied for life. This is awesome news. And then Jesus throws her another curveball. Because suddenly in the middle of a conversation about water, he makes a statement that has nothing to do with water, not even close. He says in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. What? What does that have to do with this living water? So she answers him, I have no husband. Now, obviously, that's a risk, as we'll see in a second. But she makes the statement, and then suddenly Jesus comes back to her again with a surprise answer, an answer that there's no way she could have anticipated. He says to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. You want to stop somebody in their tracks, that's probably a pretty good way to do it. Just give them their family history there. But Jesus didn't do that out of trying to shame her, to condemn her, judge her, or attack her. No. Jesus made the statement to reveal to her something about himself. Because she was on the right track in her confusion, in her curiosity, that he was not your average person. But she can't quite understand how he knows all this information. And this is information that's very painful. 
But what we tend to forget in our society is we pull it all the blame on the woman at the well. And we say, immoral woman, shame on you. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus points it out for a different reason. To show that he is a special person. He knows full well that she lives in a society where as a woman, she has almost no rights. She's not the one that divorced those five husbands. Can you imagine five men that chose you at one point, then rejected you, cast you to the curb? And now in desperation, because you live in a society, if you're a woman, you need a man to support you, whether it's dad at the beginning or a husband later on. And then in the end, you hope to God that you have several faithful kids who will take care of you in your old age. You're now stranded. You are an outcast with no means of support. You're desperate and you do what you have to do to take care of yourself. We don't know about the sixth guy outside of the fact he's not a husband. Why he moved in with her? Was it he just wanted the sex? Was he just wanted to use her? Obviously, he didn't seem to be worried too much about his own status, but she's acutely aware of hers, and everybody else is making it really clear to her that she's an outcast. And so as he applies all this information to her, she begins to wonder again, who are you? And so she takes her best guess. And she says to him in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. How else could you know this unless God or somebody's given you the information? But now she also gives us a hint that things have gotten probably a little too personal. Because instead of going on about her personal life, she asks him a question. She spins it on him. And she says to him there in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So help me out, sir. I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. You Jews say that you're supposed to worship in the temple in Jerusalem. That's the holy city, and that's where you're supposed to worship. We Samaritans, on the other hand, said, you know, we don't like you. You won't let us because of our half-breed status. The fact that we intermarried with other people, okay, non-Jewish during captivity, we're now considered subhuman to you, so you won't even let us in the temple. Fine. So be it. We'll create our own temple. We have our own mountain. We worship where we want to worship. Oh, and by the way, your scriptures, we don't like them very well either. Okay? You have the law, you have history, you have the Psalms and Proverbs, and you also have the prophets. Eh, all we care about is the law, the first five books of the Bible. So, sir, you know so much, you tell me. Who's right? You Jews over here or we Samaritans? It takes the spotlight off her momentarily. But then Jesus graciously continues and again piques her interest just a little bit more. As he says, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman's struggling. She doesn't understand a whole lot about how religious things work, but she's trying to understand. And Jesus suddenly says, you're not going to worry about Jerusalem and the temple there. You're not going to worry about the one in Samaria either. There's a time coming, and in fact, it's already started because I'm here, where I'm bringing in a whole new movement, and I'm bringing in God's kingdom. And suddenly, you're going to go from a very formal, 
a very distant type of worship at many times to a very personal worship. And place will not matter so much as your heart will matter and your relationship with God. That's what will matter. Now again, she takes one more desperate stab in this conversation and says back to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. You're right, sir. I don't know a whole lot. I can't even wrap my head about what you're saying. I just know, I've been told that one day the Messiah will come. And the Messiah will answer all the questions. Give us relief. That's all I can tell you, sir. And then, one last time, he blows her mind. Because he looks at her and he says, guess what? I am the Messiah. I am he. Now she had hope for a moment with the living water. But now, wow, you're the Messiah? I'm speaking to the Messiah? Think about this for a second. In the book of John, this is the first time that Jesus reveals that he's the Messiah to anyone except his disciples. Are you kidding me? This is huge news. He doesn't go to some rich noble. He doesn't go to a highfalutin politician, a military hero. He doesn't even go to his own people, the Jews. Forget man. He doesn't talk to men or women on the Jewish side. He comes to Samaria, a woman greatly in need of hope. And he has a conversation that he's not supposed to be having. Totally focused on her. He's gotten rid of his disciples. It's just one-on-one. And at the end of the conversation, he says, I have great news for you. I am the Messiah. I'm here. Now, as far as we can tell, this woman never gives Jesus a drink of water. (laughs) And then she just abandons the water pot altogether and she's gone. And she's racing back to a bunch of people that will have nothing to do with her. Doesn't even break stride. She hits town and she says two things. She doesn't have a lot of information She doesn't know a whole lot of things. No time to put together all these glorious logical arguments to convince anyone. She simply goes and says, this is what I know, first of all. I met somebody who knows everything about me that I've ever done. By the way, could this man be the Messiah? She doesn't try to argue with him. She doesn't try to persuade him. She just says, hey, you might want to check it out yourself. But I met somebody incredible that tells me he's the Messiah. By the way, he has something going for him. He told me all about my life too. Would you be interested in checking it out? And we're told in the passage ahead that right there, some of these people that scorned her and would have nothing to do with her believed in Jesus as the Messiah right there on her testimony. Then others said, you know what? We're going to take you up on that offer. We're going to go check this guy out. Hmm. Who is this guy? How could he do this? And they too, many of them, come to believe in him. And they're so excited, they invite him to stay with them, a Jewish rabbi, to stay with them, the Samaritan outcasts. The whole town comes together and says, spend time with us. And he spends two full days with them. Unbelievable. Not with the Jews. Not with his own people. But with a group of outcasts that are willing to listen. 
and he spends two days, and by the time he's done, there's a whole lot of believers amongst the group. So four things I want you to think about today as you think about this passage. Number one, very, very important point, is God sees every one of us as somebody made in his image, no matter how defaced we are. He sees us for who we are, someone made in his image. When I was a young boy, we lived in Burns, Oregon. My dad was in the Forest Service, and we spent a lot of time cruising through the timber and out across the deserts. And one of our favorite activities was, especially as a little kid, was looking for arrowheads. I love to find real arrowheads. And so we'd go out and you'd find these arrowheads, and that was cool, especially if you could find one totally intact. But what was really cool is when you'd be looking in the dirt and you'd see just a piece of something sticking up and you really couldn't tell what it was. And we get excited, my brothers and and uh, sister and I, and we go over and start clawing at it. And if we're lucky, the dirt and the mud would give way, and there would be a stone bowl pounding and grinding that the Indians used, or one of their other pieces of jewelry, um, um, pottery. Those were the real prizes. Those were the things that had value. And as you scraped back the dirt and the mud, you saw that. And Jesus tenderly looked at the Samaritan woman just as he looks at us. Let me wipe a little mud off. Let me dust off this part for a second. Let me reveal to you your own worth. The second thing is... God tells us in the Bible, if you truly seek God, you will find him. Now, you have to understand what you mean, he means by seeking, okay? If my goal is to find the genie in the bottle, okay, so I've got this all-powerful being that I just have to rub the outside of the bottle, and suddenly, boom, out comes the genie and says, what do you want? And I say, all kinds of things. Okay, I need a new car, I need a new house, I need a new job, I need a new vacation, I need whatever. No, good luck. You will not find him. Because you have to truly seek to know, like the woman at the well, who are you? Who are you, Jesus? Jesus makes some very strong claims. He claims to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And he says, if you truly seek me, you will find me. I will supply the answers. Because God is waiting for us, for a personal relationship one-on-one, if we will simply take the time to pursue one with him. Third, Jesus tells the woman at the well, there's only one source of living water. We're not talking about physical water like I was talking about and slacking my thirst momentarily on a hot day, even though that's really wonderful, and I'm very glad we have those options. He's talking about providing you with eternal life, hope in this world and in the next. Because what the Samaritan woman doesn't know is in a short time, Jesus is about to sacrifice his life for hers and for me, and for you, and everybody who did or will ever walk on this planet. And he's about to give us that offer, if you'll accept my sacrifice, I will welcome you into God's family, my father says. God the Father will say, come into the family. But there's only one way. The world promises a lot of great options. Here's the key to success. Here's the key to your career. Here's the key to more possessions, more wealth, more friends, more whatever. And all of those ring true for a short period of time, and then they fall flat. They just drop dead. The only thing that answers long-term and fully 
is Jesus living water. And the final thing that is exciting to me is Jesus says, I don't care how much you know, but if you trust me, I give you all you need to know to tell somebody else about who I am. This woman didn't sit down and say, okay, I've got the good news. I'm going to keep it to myself. She immediately sprints off to share it with somebody. She also doesn't sit down and say, I need a really well put together testimony. I'm going to have to work on this, make sure it's really well polished. Doesn't sit down and say, what are the best ways to approach apologetics or theology? No. She takes the one thing she has, a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ, and she says, here's all I can tell you at this point. He told me all there is to know about me. To me, that suggests that he's someone unique. Then he told me he was the Messiah. So let me ask you, do you think he's the Messiah? If you're sitting here today as somebody that's not sure, take time to check out Jesus and his word. Check it out and ask truly. Jesus, are you who you say you are? And if you are a believer sitting here today, as Joe talked about, the communion's coming up. An opportunity to remind ourselves we have the gospel of hope. And there are a lot of people in our world, just like the woman from the well, are desperate for hope. A woman who for years has had no hope at all And it's probably at the point where she figures there's never going to be any hope. And Jesus meets her face to face. And tells her, join my family. I want you as one of my daughters. As you're sitting out there, God is calling you sons and daughters. And those of us believe we need to share that good news And not worry about how fancy or how well put together our presentation is. Just say, this is what I know. You might want to check him out and see if he's the Messiah. Because the cool thing is, God will deliver on his promises. For those who are not believers, a chance to find real hope. For those of us who are believers, a chance to cling to that hope and to share it with other people. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the honesty of the woman at the well. Father, thank you for a woman who was open-minded, a woman who said, I don't know, but I want to know. A woman who said, obviously, I'm hurting. I've got that part figured out. Can you give me hope? And Father, just help us to remember that that same Jesus is alive and well today. And if we've not accepted him, he's waiting for us to come to him and ask about him. And if we are one of his children, he is sitting there, a proud, loving, caring father, who's sitting with open arms, tears coming down his face, arms widespread saying, come, come, sit on my lap. Allow me to gather you in my arms and comfort you, my son or daughter. Allow me to comfort you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to the table. We thank you for this time that you have uh, enacted for us to remember your sacrifice that you made on the cross for us, Lord. And Lord, as we partake today of the Um, bread and the 
the juice. We just ask that uh, um, we will remember this sacrifice as we go through this week, and we'll remember the gift that you've given us that we will share with those that we come in contact with. We ask this all in your name. Amen. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and blessed it and said, This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Mm 